<laughs> Good show, Clarissa. Jemima gets them guessing by Hilda Richards. Read by Lisa Dillon. Step on it, Bessie B. What? Jemima Carstairs said cheerfully. Oh, really, Jimmy? Bessie Bunter expostulated perspiringly. I'm hot. Besides, I've only just finished my turn at carrying the picnic hamper. Hot it most certainly was. Just the day, in fact, for a picnic in the cool quietude of Monk's Cove, for which these five Cliff House girls were bound. Only Jemima Carstairs, monocle agleam, sleek straight hair brushed back with meticulous neatness, looked cool and self-possessed. But Jemima would have looked that in the tropics. Cheer up, chumplets, she said. Only fifty miles or so to Peg. Which, of course, was an exaggeration, for Peg, the tiny fishing village where they had arranged to pick up the boat and row round to Monk's Cove, was less than a hundredth part of that distance. And odds bods, Jemima breathed. Do my ancient eyes deceive me? Or is this the friend of thy sweet youth I see approaching, Clara beloved? Clara paused. The girl trudging up the hill, her dead white face frowning and sulky, was Francis Frost. Take no notice, Clara muttered. For Francis Frost, the icicle of the fourth form, and Clara Trevlin, captain of games, were not friends. Francis had been sour because Clara had included her only as reserve for next Saturday's match with Whitechester, which stung Francis. Apart from that, Francis had been openly hinting that Clara was the girl who had been seen yesterday, leaving the forbidden Palais de Danse in Courtfield Town. Clara had, though she had only visited the Palais out of a sense of friendship and duty to little Madge Stevens of the third form. Madge, unfortunately, had been lately bitten with the dance craze bug, and yesterday sneaked off to the Palais again. Clara, hearing that ill-natured Sarah Harrigan of the Sixth was on her track, had rushed off to bring her back. But somebody, obviously, had seen Clara and Madge leaving the Palais and reported the matter to Miss Primrose. Fortunately, that somebody had not been able to identify the two girls, merely that they were from Cliff House. Frances now planted herself in front of Clara. What's biting you? Clara asked. You know, said Frances, my place in the team. Am I still down as a reserve? I've told you before, yes. Well. Francis said with a shrug. I've kept it dark about you being at the Palais yesterday. Surely it's up to you to return the favour. It would be too bad if Miss Primrose did get to know about that, because then you'd be detained for certain, and I would play, after all, in your place. No! Clara blazed out. Now go and eat Coke! And she marched away. Babs and Co. followed. At the boathouse, Mabel Lynn, known as Mabs, suddenly said, Where's Jemima? Stop behind to talk to Francis, I think, said Babs. Clara glowered. Why should Jemima ever want to talk to Francis? They loaded the hamper into the boat. After ten minutes, Babs and Clara toiled back up the hill in search of Jemima. Babs paused. Look, she whispered. Through a hedge, two figures. Francis Frost, and thoughtfully polishing her eyeglass, Jemima Carstairs. She was saying, oh, absolutely, what? High-handed old Spartan, our Clara. Of course, came Frances' scornful reply. She won't put me in the team because she's too busy finding places for her pals. I wonder your friend's with her. Ah, yes, Jemima agreed. But tis a sad thing we cannot always choose for friends those girls we would, what? You know what I mean. Well, not quite. But said Clara Trevlin, bursting through the hedge. I do. She stood before them. Thanks, Jimmy, for your good opinion of me. I'm glad I heard it. Jemima said nothing. Rather uncomfortably, she polished her monocle. Babs caught Clara's arm. Come on. And Clara, with a wondering look at the elegant enigma of the fourth, went. The picnic at Monk's Cove was by no means the cheery meal which Babs and co. had looked forward to. Birds twittered in the wild rose bushes that clung to the chalk face of the cliff. Before them was spread the picnic cloth, laden with every delicious dainty that a schoolgirl's heart and appetite could yearn for, with the kettle hissing merrily on the primer stove nearby. Even dreary old Belwyn Island, half a mile out to sea, seemed transformed. 
But it was hard for the Cliff House girls to believe that Jemima could have turned traitor to Clara like that. Hello? Bessie Bunter looked up. Somebody's coming. A slithering sound came from beyond a ledge of the cliff. Then a voice. Careful, Francis, old topper. It's Jemima, said Mabs. Jemima's voice came again. Whoa, dash it, there goes my eyeglass. Ah, she added, as supporting Francis, she came into view. Any of the old picnic left? Just trickled across country, you know. Mind if I bring a friend to tea? Negotiating the last few feet of path, she leapt onto the beach. Francis sauntered towards the picnic with her. Sit down, Francis, Jemima said, and make yourself at sea. <laughs> at home, I should say. Clara, beloved, wouldst pass a chunk of the old Dundee? Francis giggled. <laughs> I say, Jemima, this is jolly. Top hole, Jemima agreed. Clara turned away. Clara, Francis said mockingly, isn't in a conversational mood, obviously. She's better when she can choose her own company, Babs returned tartly. Francis scowled. Well, go and eat coke. Clara rose. I think I'll have a stroll along the beach. But Jemima waved her hand. Alas, no, I perceive we are not required at the festive board. Let us, she continued, take our portion to yonder island, where away from the turpitude of these troubled shores, we will make our feast at peace with each other. Don't mind if I borrow the boat, Babs. Do what you like, said Babs. Jimmy, said Francis, we shall be back by five. I am thy slave, fair Francis, Jemima replied, and scooped half the picnic into the boat. Get in, my merry mariner. Clara turned her back. Jemima followed Francis into the boat. I'll take the tiller, you take the oars, she said. Marvellous exercise of rowing. I'll hold your blazer. Francis took off her blazer and handed it to the amazing Jemima. She didn't notice that Jemima carelessly slipped her hand into one of the pockets. Now hoist the blue, Peter, said Jemima. Farewell. The boat pulled away. Jemima turned to wave a hand, and Babs and Mabs, watching angrily, both frowned. For in the hand which Jemima waved was a green slip of paper, and one eye of Jemima had closed in a most deliberate and significant wink. The island was reached, and in Ebb's Cove they beached the boat, unloaded the tuck, and walked up the shelving shore. Belester Towers is the spot, I think, on the oppo side of the island, said Jemima. Jolly views and so forth, what? Francis smiled. Jemima, you won't forget I've got to get back to Peg by five o'clock. Ah, oh, meeting someone? N n not exactly. I've something important to get. They trudged on. Then all at once. Oh, dash, cried Jemima. What's the matter? Left my jolly old bag in the merry old boat. Awful nuisance. My very best eyeglass is in it, too. Francis, you toddle onto the towers, Wilt. I'll just toddle back. You take the tuck. And with a careless nod, Jemima strolled back. Bab's eyes were on Belwyn Island. I say, look. Round the headland of the island, a boat with a solitary rower had just come into view. It was Jemima, alone. Then they heard a faint, far-off shout. It's Francis, cried Babs. Francis, it was, marooned on the island. She had now seen the boat. On an out-jutting point of rock she stood, frantically waving her hands. Seems peeved, grinned Mabs. But why on earth has Jimmy stranded her there? While Francis yelled and danced, Jemima arrived. Tough work rowing, what? she said as she stepped ashore. What's the time, Babs? A half past four. But Jimmy, how long to row to Peg? said Jemima. About twenty minutes, but good, Jemima beamed. Now, have I got the old passport? And she brought out the little green slip, which Babs and Mabs recognised now as a chemist's counterfoil. So long, said Jemima. Rescue Francis if a storm blows up or an earthquake happens, will you? Coolly, she stepped back into the boat, pushed an oar into the shingle, and floated away. Francis, meantime, continued to yell. Half an hour passed. Then from the direction of Sarmouth came a solitary fishing boat. 
Suddenly, it turned about. Babs and Co. saw the boat reach the island. They saw it returning with Francis in a fine old fury sitting in the thwarts. Then, from the direction of Peg, came another boat. Francis' boat reached the shore first. She was livid as she jumped out. Where's Jemima? A fine trick to jolly well maroon me. What ho! Jemima rushed her boat onto the beach. So my little Simbad has escaped. Tut tut. Jemima! Francis blazed. Well, ho there, hold her off! Jemima cried. Naughty, naughty little display of temper. Now, now, tell me, Francis, what it feels like to be a shipwrecked mariner. Jimmy, you beast! You knew I had an appointment. Alas, yes. I thought I would save you the trouble by keeping it myself, but you knew nothing about it. Jemima sighed. I did. This morning, having tottered my way through the shaded cloisters of Cliff House, I overheard you talking to Lydia Crossendale. Francis jerked upright. And weren't you telling fair Lydia? Jemima went on that you had taken a snapshot of Clara and Madge Stevens coming out of the Palais de Dons yesterday. Clara stared. And didn't you tell Lydia? Jemima went on softly, that you had sent that snap with others to the chemist at Peg to be printed, and that you were calling for them at five o'clock this afternoon. And didn't you say that if Clara still refused to give you a place in the team on Saturday, that you'd send the snap anonymously to Miss Primrose, meaning, of course, that Clara would be gated while you got her place? No, I didn't. Panted Francis. Clara looked at her with a new light of understanding in her eyes. And so Jemima went on. At the grave risk of being misunderstood, I said to myself, "Jimmy, as Clara's pal, you've got to do something." And so I did. You mean, Babs gulped. You made friends with Francis in order to, yes, to get the counterfoil, and then to make sure that Francis was in a safe place while I went and collected the snaps. Coolly, Jemima produced a packet from her coat. She took out one snap and one negative. The snap unmistakably showed Clara and Madge, with above them the name in neon lights of the Palais de Danse. You rotter! Fumed the icicle of the fourth. Give me those! And savagely snatching the negative and print from Jemima, she started across the loose shingle. But in her haste, she tripped and went headlong. Next moment, she was captured by Clara. Immediately, the negative and print were in Jemima's possession. Who, with a smile, approached the stove and dropped the incriminating evidence onto it. Negative and print flared up with a splutter. Jemima handed the rest of the snaps back to their owner. Well, she polished her monocle and beamed round. I do hope I'm forgiven. Now you all understand. We understand," nodded Clara. "Jimmy, I'm sorry. I ought to have known better." And what have you to say, Francis? Hang you! Snarled Francis, and with a bitter look at Jemima, she strode towards the path that led upwards to the cliff. Jemima Carstairs sighed. Alas, she muttered, I fear that Francis and I will ne'er be friends again. Which, like most of strange Jemima's prophecies, came true. Lisa Dillon was reading Jemima Gets Them Guessing by Hilda Richards. The director was Martin Jarvis, and Good Show Clarissa is a Jarvis and Ayres production for BBC Radio Four.